This is Binod Shankar and you're listening to the Real Finance Mentor podcast from the realfinancementor.com. The Real Finance Mentor is your go-to resource for insight and inspiration on careers in finance, CFA and more. I would think why this podcast? Well, my goal is to deliver insight and inspiration for your finance career by making it one relatable. This is not theoretical stuff. We zero in on the critical practical issues. Number 2, authentic. No bullshit, no side stepping. The topics, guests and questions are all from that perspective. And number 3, take a chartered accountant and CFA charter holder, add 17 plus years as a corporate warrior, mix in 10 years of entrepreneurship, throw in a decade of full-time CFA training, add speaking, mentoring, cycling and mountaineering, and that's me. Welcome to the real finance mentor, or as I call it, RFM. Hi everyone, this is Binod Shankar here with the Real Finance Mentor podcast. the podcast that brings you insight and inspiration for your careers and where i try to bring people who have vast experience in leadership um transitions soft skills mentoring and coaching etc today i have with me a guest who is a lawyer unusually because we normally have people with a finance background on the show and she's an entrepreneur as well specializing in real estate Hazel Shakur Quinn has over two decades experience uh, advising businesses on how best to tackle their complex real estate problems. Her clients have included Middle East sovereign wealth funds, family offices, tech companies, major developers and investors and international businesses. She also has first hand experience of running a real estate business because she co-founded one of the largest chartered surveying consultancies in the Middle East. She is a seasoned public speaker who is regularly invited to speak at industry events and she's also a leading advocate for gender diversity in the legal industry. In fact, she has initiated and led numerous events and programs during her career designed to empower women and give them uh, the tools and soft skills to enable them to smash the proverbial glass ceiling. Hazel, welcome to the show. Thank you Benod. I I promise not to be too lawyerly. <laughs> Now, I'm going to start from the beginning as I always like to because it sets the context and gives a good foundation for our subsequent discussions uh, since I have a lot of questions to ask you as well. Your parents were immigrants from Pakistan, Hazel, who inexplicably settled in a village in a remote part of Scotland. The setting couldn't have been more different. our upbringing of course has a massive effect on how we turn out as adults and your unusual environment makes me quite curious especially what are the three most important ways in which those early years shaped who you are in terms of values beliefs traits and skills um let me just put context around the unusual environment So I grew up in a remote freezing part of Scotland called the Isle of Lewis. Um absolutely beautiful. If you get the opportunity to visit, go. Amazing beaches, beautiful scenery. I was the fourth youngest set of five kids. And as you said my parents were Pakistani. I had a very different upbringing to them. They grew up at the time that India was partitioned into India and Pakistan and some of the stories i remember them telling me about that time were really quite traumatic and i i just couldn't imagine as a child going through those kind of huge events um my parents were they had a really strong work ethic they were entrepreneurs but they were also fun and very loving and to me it seemed like it seemed that they just lived their life to provide the best opportunities for their kids and they had a huge influence over me in the early years and and later on in life and i think you know the first way i felt that was in my values um so they just incredible work ethic and that desire and need to work hard was transferred on to me so they they always told us as as children knowledge and education are intellectual assets once you have them inside your head no one can take them from you 
And in order to get a good education and have a good career, uh, you need to work hard. And probably the, the footnote there for me is I think at that time, like many Asian parents, my parents identified good professions as being the traditional ones, you know, doctors, lawyers, pharmacists, accountants. So that was kind of the, 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 the professional basket that I was looking at. But they didn't just talk the talk in terms of hard work. They walked the walk. They, they had their own business. They worked six days a week. Um, and they never moaned, you know, they never, ever moaned about having to work hard. It's something that they did, something that they taught us. And it, it, although my perception of it has changed over those 20 years, it's still one of my core values. The, the second one is, I'd say it's independence. I had really strong female role models when I was growing up. And my, my mum, she used to say this to me and my, my older sisters on a repeat basis. You need to get a good career so you can be financially independent and you never need to rely on a man or anyone else. And funnily enough, that was probably in complete contrast to what other Asian girls might have been told at the same time. So we know there is a familiar story where they might have been encouraged in an alternative path, have a higher education, leave the career to one side, get married, look after a husband and kids. And that was never the forefront of the narrative that I learned. So in hindsight, I'm pretty grateful my parents had a progressive mindset. It, it really did shape my desire to be independent. And then I, I watched I watched my, my older sisters go to university, have amazing careers, uh, become doctors, scientists, business specialists. And I looked up to them. I was the youngest. They were intelligent, independent, and they were fun to be around. So I wanted to be like them. And I always had a Saturday job and I always had some job during the summer holidays. And I love that feeling of earning my own money. And that, that, that just stayed with me. It was such an important feeling to me. Um, and that independent trait, that just, it just increased as I got older, it never left me. And you asked for three, didn't you? Mm. Um, so I'd probably call it a moulding experience. Um, and it was the moulding experience that my father's influence had on my self-confidence. And, yeah, it, it left a, a, a deep impression on me and, and made a huge impact on me. And he was a quiet, shy man. Um, but he was so well respected. And when he said something, people really listened, including me. And he had one of the most influ powerful influences on my mindset. So he, he never said, you can't do that. And he never said, that's too hard. He always said, of course you can do it. And I guess, Benod, it's, it's the consistency and the tone that that really kind of stay in my mind when I think about him, because it was said without doubt. It was said without raising or lowering his voice. It was so consistent, um, and and that that kind of constant reassurance, uh, removal of doubt, that stayed with me throughout my my kind of younger years as I became older, even through my adulthood. And I, I remember the best example. Um, when you finished law school, um, back in those days, you had to do something called a traineeship. It's like a two-year apprenticeship and the end of it. You need to do it in order to become a qualified lawyer. And at that time, it was super competitive. I think for 
every one application, there were 900 applicants. So naturally, I felt nervous submitting the applications to, to all of these law firms that I really wanted to work at, thinking, gosh, do I have a chance? Um, am I going to get one? And I shared that with my dad. And he, he just said to me, you will make a great lawyer. You can work anywhere. And then he said nothing. And when, when I reflect on it, it felt like he skipped Hazel as a trainee lawyer and he just went straight to Hazel as a qualified lawyer yeah. working in a law firm. And the way he used pauses, that just allowed me to put myself in that position. So I was still nervous applying for traineeships, but I felt more certain that I would get one and I'd get one at a good law firm. So just that consistency and that reassurance and the kind of no doubt about how he installed that in me it was just hugely powerful. And I'm, I'm so grateful. Um, as a child, seeing it now, I'm so grateful for, for that influence. Hmm. That's a great introduction and quite valuable context. And that explains a lot of how you turned out to be. I want to shift from the personal to the professional, specifically in terms of management leadership at this stage. Now, we both know of many cases where mid-level managers are stuck in their careers and don't get promoted or don't change roles or move up because they lack something or many things. I've got two questions here, Hazel. The first question is, from what you have seen in your long career, what are the crucial traits or skills that most managers lack and that's holding them back and, and why is it holding them back? What do they lack? Um, based on what I've seen, I, I call them the selfies. Um, so the first thing I'd say is lack of self-confidence, lack of self-awareness or lack of self-esteem. And I've seen some managers just have such a negative inner view of themselves and it holds them back because they have feelings of, I'm not worthy of promotion or they don't believe they've got the abilities or the skills to go to the next level. And over time, they, they allow those feelings to almost cripple them. And what happens is they become a little bit frozen and stuck in that middle management limbo. But I've also witnessed something that is harder to identify, but I've seen a lack of confidence in mid-level managers portray itself as insecurity disguised as arrogance. Mm. So I, I reckon everyone listening probably knows that one person in the room that's he or she's got to be the one to talk first, to talk over everyone. And when there's any question about something's gone wrong, they're super quick to attribute blame, but that blame is never directed inwardly. And that's damaging because I've seen some of those managers just get stuck in their careers because they don't recognize and it's lack of self-awareness as well. They don't recognize that senior management are looking at them saying they don't have leadership qualities because quite often part of the promotion process is 360 evaluations. And if your team are not saying positive things and showing your kind of senior managers that your leadership quality, that can actually hinder your progression. And um, for managers who have a client facing role, when senior management recognize it, a lot of the times what happens is sometimes it's not addressed and they just get taken out of the client facing roles and moved sideways to, to what we sometimes call back of shop. Um, and that can just 
be quite detrimental to progression. And the other thing I've seen, it's not a lack of something, it's an abundance of fear. That fear of admitting to being wrong. And, and I do mean admitting to be wrong. It's not a fear of being wrong. It's the, the fear of admitting to other people, I got that wrong because they don't want people to see that they failed. And it's that perception of they think people are talking about them and their failures. And fear, it's also fear of uncertainty, fear of the unknown. So quite often you'll see middle managers just overstaying their welcome, in middle management. They're playing it safe. They're comfortable there. They know what it took to get to the top of that mid-level mountain and they're gonna stay there because it's pretty comfortable. They can see the senior management mountain, but it feels hard and they don't know how to get up it. They don't know how to operate at that level. They don't know the skills, the traits. And so that that's a fear they don't want to, to confront. So that's interesting in terms of you know lack of self-confidence and self-esteem and the abundance of fear holding back. So Hazel, my second question to you would be, what are some meaningful yet practical ways by which they can get more confident or manage the fear and generally just get better at, and so that they can rise fast to the top? Yeah. Um... I'd say I'm really conscious, especially after seeing what happened after the COVID-19 pandemic, and mental health has got to be the num number one priority. Mm. So if there's a feeling of low self-esteem or low confidence, and it's been present there for a long time and it feels deep rooted, um, I think it's worth exploring or seeking help from a professional therapist, just in case it actually reveals something more deep rooted that needs a specialist to unlock, because trying to layer all these kind of development skills on top of that is going to push that down. So that's my kind of footnote in terms of if something feels very deep rooted. Otherwise, my advice would be to just recommend small steps small practices so they become habit um, and focus on building just more confident leadership behaviors um, and there's lots of practical ways you can do that so so many mid managers already have teams that they manage and a great way to improve leadership skills and build your confidence is to manage those teams well um, and that includes giving them feedback. So understanding, do you give good feedback now? Do you give your teams clear KPIs, clear uh, key performance indicators that you can measure in a year's time, tick, 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 or you didn't meet that? Um, and do you have timetables associated with each of these KPIs? Because that in itself is a bit of magic. Once your team start developing, they're developing because they're a the good leader. And you'll be amazed at the conversations that go around the water machine between your team and senior management. And that builds your human capital within the organization. And that feeling of developing somebody, um, get rid of ins any insecurity around, I don't want anyone on my team to be better than me. But the flip side of that, that's a positive flip side, is you start thinking in your appraisals, am I getting measurable KPIs? Because possibly that's an external factor that internally you're not raising that might hold you back. So being conscious, am I getting measurable, measurable KPIs? Um, are they things I can meet? What are my KPIs to get to the next level? Um, and that's when you see that played out over 12 months, um, it's, it can be quite powerful and that can really boost self-confidence. 
if you're naturally negative and you find yourself using negative language, another way to boost confidence is to use positive language. It sounds so basic, Benoit, but just mm. making positive language, everyday language, a habit. So in a work contest, if somebody asks you to do something, the answer is yes. Just try instead of saying yes or okay, just replace it with one word, absolutely. If you're used to saying, I think, swap it out for, I believe. That the end result is the same, but it just feels more positive and it gives yourself that reassurance. And where you do make positive statements, particularly about yourself or a situation you've been in, avoid that temptation to follow the positive statement with word but because we know what comes after but is just a negative statement that's going to negate what you've said so your manager saying to you oh, you did a great job on that project oh thanks very much and just stop because the temptation is, thanks very much, but anyone in my situation would have done the same. <laughs> so it really takes, and pausing is a great way to do that. And then it's the inner voice of saying to yourself, just stop, that's enough, and swallow. Because something, a physical action, just can stop you from, from going on and to say something negative. Solutions to overcoming fear, there's there's a lot. Um, but again, I'd start small. Admitting to being wrong in everyday low stake situations, start building that as a habit. Um, and it makes you comfortable with the feeling of just admitting to failure. So practice that at home. Um, at the coffee shop just small admissions of failure or you've done something wrong and let people hear it um, and that you just become more comfortable with that I think push, pushing yourself outside your comfort zone kind of helps with that feeling of I'm comfortable I'm going to stay here and be quite safe in this middle management position. I've been here a few years. And sometimes actually doing something outside of work, um, where you push yourself outside your comfort zone can help, whether that's a new sport that you've never done before or learning a new language. Um, <laughs> I recommend, if, if people haven't explored it, um, I, I took it up a couple of years ago. I recommend Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I started doing it because it's it's really more about mental strength than it is your physical ability to overpower someone. And my God, Benoît, I feel uncomfortable for the 60 minutes that I'm sparring at Jiu-Jitsu. I'm rubbish at it, but I love it. Um, and that's that's a really good exercise. It's something new. It's something I hadn't done before. Um, but I had a very good coach. So if there are Dubai based listeners, there's there's a coach. Um, I think he's at the UFC gym in Business Bay. A guy called Coach Rafael Barbosa. He is just brilliant at unlocking that mental and physical ability. Um, and and that that just sometimes does does wonders for people. I think the last thing I'd say is find out what it takes to progress in your company. So that that fear of the unknown or uncertainty that can be reduced quite a lot if you actually know. Okay, this is the process. This is what the expectations are. Here are the skills I'm actually being told by my company. I need to progress. And then you can start the journey. How do I get them? Or you can recognize, hey, hang on a minute. I have some of these skills. So that's another source of confidence, knowing, you know what? You have some of what it takes. So that can really boost confidence, get rid of that fear. Mm. 
I want to talk about something related, which is personality change. And I've always been utterly fascinated, Hazel, by how people change or don't change over a long period of time. I have certainly changed. I won't list out the changes because of the many, for lack of a better word, cringeworthy acts of omission and commission. <laughs> when you look back and think, oh my God, how could you have thought, said, or done that? Now, you probably think deeply and honestly, both about yourself and others having traversed um, 20 years of your career. If you look back now, Hazel, can you tell me three cases in which you have evolved? Specifically, the first question would be three key ways in which you have evolved in the way you manage yourself. Um, oh, by the way, Vinod, I've got cringeworthy moments as well. I could feel my shoulders just rising up, thinking of some of them, so I'll, I'll put my shoulders back down. Um, the way I've managed myself, I am now, I'm ruthless with my time. Um, it is one of my most treasured commodities and I, over the years, I've just become very efficient at how I plan and use my time. Um, I'm deliberate about how I allocate my time as well. And I noticed um, when I was working during the pandemic, that became more so. So, for example, Teams or Zoom meetings, we just as a workforce got caught up in that horrible rounding up situation where everything was an hour long. So for example, now I won't do an hour long Zoom or team if it's not required, if I think it can be done in 36 minutes. And I, I, I do get that precise. I'm geeky enough to get that precise. So if I think 36 minutes, I'll set the invitation for 40 I'll put a timer on my iPhone for 36 minutes, it will go off and I'll start rounding up. And that extra 20 minutes is just, you can go and do something else with it. So yeah, pretty pretty ruthless. It's rare for me to turn up to an hour long uh, Zoom call. But that was, that was a kind of a voyage of discovery to become a good time manager. Um, and I, I read a lot of books. So the one here's the one I'd recommend if people are not good at time management, because I got a lot of learning and insight from it. It's a book called Eat That Frog uh, by a, a chap called Brian Tracy. Um, and his website's quite good as well, briantracy.com. It's, it's got the same tips on it. But he had three really good tips and over the years I've implemented these techniques and I just do them consistently so the, the first one is pretty simple it's just writing a to-do list and prioritizing the most important tasks first so when I and this is the same for lots of people when you write something down you think better when you write so just thinking I've got to do X, Y, and Z today, you forget because something else slices into your day. So writing it down, um, and I use a combination. So I'm trying to go paperless. Um, being the, the typical lawyer, I love writing. So I, I use something called the Books Lumi, and it's, it's a digital notepad. But the reason I like it is it's the closest thing I've found to feeling like you're writing on paper. So that's why I use that. So I write my lists on that, but I also combine that with blocking off chunks of time in my calendar. And that's actually, when you block off chunks of time in your calendar, if you're in a big organization, that allows other people to see that you're busy and it reduces the amount of people that just slice into your time. So writing lists, putting them in my calendar, do that religiously. Um, I 
also learned a really good technique from the eat that frog. And when he's talking about eat that frog, the frog is just symbolic of that big, fat, ugly task you just don't want to do. So you just need to, to eat it and find a way of doing it. I prefer the analogy of eat my cake. Uh, I like a slice of cake. I'm not going to eat the whole cake at once. I'm going to have a slice and that might last me over a week. So if I've got a big, unwieldy or daunting task, um, I typically split it up into bite-sized chunks, so into mini tasks. And that helps to make it less daunting. But it also means when you finish that small mini task, you're less likely to procrastinate about doing the next mini task and the next one and the next one. And you finish. But I never start the task unless I've planned the mini tasks. And I thought, approximately how long is it going to take me to do each task? Um, and then when I do do the task, if it's an hour long, I make sure I've got everything I need around me. If, if that's a super strong coffee, then that's a super strong coffee. I don't look at social media. I don't look at emails. I just do that task. And that's taken years to, to, to get to a level where I'm really confident that I can do that. Um, but practicing that, he's got lots more tips on his website that are quite similar to that. Um, Personal tip I'd give to more junior managers, especially if you're reporting or working for more than two senior managers, is manage expectations. Um, let them know that you've got work from different managers um, because sometimes they can all tell you, oh, this is urgent because they don't know what else you've got on your plate. And when you just share that information, hey, this is what I've got on. If they're good senior managers, they'll say, do you know what? My stuff's not that urgent. Tuesday would be great, but it wouldn't hurt if you submit it on Thursday. So that's something I learned when I was very junior, working for lots of partners. Um, and the, the good behaved partners were able to understand what's best for the business. Um, so, so that's definitely a really good tip. Hmm. That's very useful for managing yourself, right? I mean, managing your time. I always say time is your most precious asset because it's a non-renewable resource and must be managed and husbanded carefully. The second question I had related to this was, sure, so managing yourself is important. It's probably the beginning, but then you have to transition if you have ambitions to be a leader to managing others. So what have you picked up along the way uh, in the way you manage others, Hazel? I think I've done a bit of a 360. I, I now, I don't have any predetermined expectations of others. Um, my hand is going in the air because I think years ago I was quite guilty of just expecting uh, people that I was supervising to work the shitty long hours I was working to just love those big deals, to love that feeling of winning. And that is not everyone's cup of tea. And recognizing that, I mean, that's why I know I've improved my self-awareness. Um, everyone doesn't think, behave the same as their manager. So that took a lot of self-awareness and increase in self-awareness to recognize that um, and we're we're like plants, you know. What's right for a cactus isn't right for a rose. So we developed in different environments. So really, having no expectations of how somebody works or how they should be working is something that I've learned to acknowledge over the years. I've definitely become way better at active listening. Um. And I'm, I'm more empathetic. So I, I've got two year, ears and one mouth. And that is a brilliant way of reminding myself to use them in that ratio. It's taken the best part of 
five or six years just to develop really good listening skills, listening to others. Um, and I started practicing on just family and friends, just forcing myself to divert thoughts so I could actually listen to what was being said. And that allowed me to ask better questions of the people I was managing and understand, well, what are their problems and wants for development? So I was able to help them more and mentoring more people. That was another good way of developing um, good management skills uh, and becoming a better leader. A lot of us don't listen. And I just wonder, Benoît, whether that's because in certain cultures, just widely speaking now, if that's not valued, you know? So quite often as children, we might be told to speak up or quite often the loudest person in the room is the one that's got the point. So if listening isn't valued from a young age, that's possibly why people don't listen when they're older. So it's it's definitely kind of something that I've I've seen manifest in itself in the workplace. Mm. I mean, talking about becoming more effective as a people manager, I mean, there are many means by which you can become an effective leader, right? I mean, you can learn by observing your bosses, uh, colleagues, peers, getting feedback from colleagues and superiors, um, by getting a mentor, for example, by reading 11 books or listening to quality podcasts. Some of this have worked for me, especially the feedback from peers and juniors, although that was the most painful part, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and reading. I've always been an avid reader ever since I was a child, and I probably go through about a couple of dozen books a year. My question is, what are the three top methods by which you developed your own leadership skills? And I'm curious, why did you prefer those methods? The three, you you actually touched on one when you talked about yourself. So um, I'll give you my top three and, and lots because I don't put it down to one thing. It was mm -hmm. observation. So you, you mentioned observing. Um, and that was something I did a lot as a junior lawyer. I observed loads when I was a child. Um, I'll slide this in here. I slept lots as a child. And I remember being told for one year of my life, I just didn't speak at school. I just observed. <laughs> um, and that need to observe has always been with me, but it was hugely helpful when I was a junior lawyer just being able to watch um, leaders or my managers. And I found it worked and it was effective because it helped me just visualize and see and hear firsthand techniques that worked, techniques that didn't work. When you see it played out, it's kind of like watching a movie. Um, you get to identify what works, what you like, what fits with you. But it also made me super aware of what didn't work and what I categorize as bad behaviors. And the bad leadership behaviors, I remember just banking them in my mind and thinking, if I do that, I'm going to call myself out. Um, and I... I can give you a, a scenario that I recall where it's kind of a, a good cop, bad cop scenario. Um, I think it was about, probably about four years into my career as a qualified lawyer. And I went along to a meeting with two quite senior partners, a client meeting. and uh, We were there to, to, to talk about a client project. But kind of by surprise, the client revealed that they had a, a big mega project coming up. I wanted to talk a bit about it and how that might be priced. And one partner, but no, he just opened his mouth and he just started talking and he didn't stop. 
And I kid you not, in that scenario, he went for about seven to ten minutes just talking about himself. And as a kind of junior observer, I just watched the three people from the client side. I watched the internal yawn and I watched them move about in their seat. And although it took the other partner a little time, he was self-aware enough to recognize what was going on. And I I just remember he just jumped in and he did it in a really effective way. He picked up the last thing that the the bad partner said and he just quickly turned it into question for the client and brought the client back into the situation and managed to take back ownership of the dialogue. And it was more like a game of tennis back and forth with a client and they revealed more information. And he did another thing when we left the meeting. He he asked the client permission to submit a proposal for the, the mega project. And it was such a kind of subtle way of putting choice back to the client. And they said something like, yeah, of course you can, and I hope you'll be leading it. And I just always remember thinking that was such a, a nuanced, subtle technique, and it worked. It worked so well. Um, so that's something that stayed in my mind, and it was years later that I was actually able to to use the technique in, a, in another situation. Um, so, yeah, that, that's quite powerful, observing other people. And then... When you become more senior, you need to realize that other people are observing you. So that's another reason that you want to display good leadership behaviors because it's going to have an impact on somebody else. Um, I think the second one is I, I consciously and deliberately take time to analyze my failures. So every, every Saturday morning, and meditate for 10 minutes. I don't get into yoga gear. I don't sit in the lotus position. Meditating for me is quite basic. It involves just sitting on one of my balconies with a cup of coffee, picking a space in a tree, staring at it. And then I just think on the week that's gone by, what did I do that went well? What did I do that didn't go well? Typically, I, I'm not focused on what didn't go well. I'm more focused on why it didn't go well and what I could have done differently. So it definitely helps just to focus on controlling what you can control. Um, and that's that's really effective to then be able to kind of become a better leader. Um, so where you can analyze and admit to your failures and actually know how to grow. Um, it's just such a, a kind of critical part of the, the journey. And I'd say the last one is, is something that's evolved over time. So it's not um, something that was fixed. It's a continuing process. Um, so it's just lots of methods to become a better communicator. Um, my own personal belief is that effective communication is just one key that unlocks multiple doors to effective leadership. It's it's just a major challenge to lead a team when you can't communicate with them. And it's an even bigger challenge to do that on a prolonged basis. And I'd say my my conscious decision to become a better communicator <laughs> was was actually triggered oh but I can feel my shoulders going up I'm cringing it was triggered by <laughs> one of my communication failures um <laughs> will I tell it will I tell my cringy story <laughs> yes, please go um, ahead all right feel free to cringe with me <laughs> so yeah it was just a disaster I'm going back now 
come back with me about 12 or 15 years um, when I was a kind of junior to mid-level uh, lawyer and I was asked to give a presentation just in a small conference setting, so probably not more than about 40 people. And I was so busy at work. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd done the typical thing of the few all-nighters. I was exhausted, so I, I threw together my slides, loads of text on them. Um, and the day of the presentation, I remember it was in a, a, a small conference room in a hotel. And I just remember feeling really dehydrated, quite tired. And I had that, I think they call it the the graveyard slot. It's the speaking slot before lunchtime. And I sat and I watched other speakers. And my heart sank when the speaker before me got up because <laughs> she was really good, uh, very prepared. I I think she was C-suite in, in one of the big banks, but really engaging presentation, had it just nailed down to a T. So anyway, I got up to speak and I stood behind the lectern. I pretty much read my text heavy slides verbatim. And I got, I don't know, through to about slide 15 and I looked up. Um, just, I could see people yawning, people disinterested. And thank God I had the the, the insight on self-awareness at that level to recognise that. So I just quickly wrapped it up and allowed people to go off and have their lunch. And I still remember that feeling of I was so disappointed with myself. I just hadn't prepared. And it was it was crap. That feeling was horrible. And I really decided over the next months and actually years, I, I wouldn't do that again. I would get better. And I did. I I, I read lots of books. Um, I kind of analysed what I was doing. And so I changed a lot. So we just look at the before and after, if you like. I rocked up and had no idea who was in the audience. Didn't really know who I was speaking to. So over the years now, if it's a big conference, I will ask for the attendee list. I'll look to see who's on there. Are there people in the audience I know? Um, are they from businesses that I'm working with at the moment? Are they businesses I want to work with? What's in it for them? Because that presenting, it wasn't about me telling them this is what I'm going to tell you. It was about what are they there to, to listen to. And I, I remember I didn't engage in the audience. So now I use lots of interactive tools. There's, there's, a, there's a good one. Even if you're doing small training sessions, that works really well. Um, it's called, I think it's called menti, mentimeter.com. And it's basically just a virtual poll that your audience can use on their phones. And it's a really good way of getting engagement, whether it's for stats, show of hands, whatever. That that works really well now. Um, I remember I mentioned I had those horrible text heavy slides that I think lots of lawyers are guilty of. Um, you can nod your head uh, if you think finance professionals are equally <laughs> guilty, but um, oh, yuck, cringe, cringe, cringe. Don't like text heavy slides and neither do my audiences. So it takes more time, but really simplifying complex business or legal concepts into a single slide using infographics is way more valuable. Um, so I learned that over time. I, I did a, a really good one with joint venture structures um, and loan agreements. So that's something I, I, I really learned. And gosh, all those years ago, I was pretty monotone. Didn't use tone. And I didn't use the room. Um, so although I wasn't on a big stage, I had the whole floor and I chose to stand and cut my body off behind the lectern 
and it's it's boring. So over term, over over time, I learned to use the floor. I learned to use my voice to inject humor, to emphasize an important point, um, and just make it more interesting. And I now try and bring the best version of myself to a presentation. Um, I, I won't pull an all-nighter. I haven't done that a long time, but I drink water. I get sleep. Sleep's superpower. I never used to be very good at it. Um, but just bringing your best version of yourself just makes a huge difference. And I was I was never a nervous speaker, but I didn't enjoy it. And over time, as I felt my confidence build and using all the various techniques that I'd learned, um, actually a, a good tip is just watching good speakers, um, watching how they use silence, pausing, tone. People like Bill Clinton where he makes eye contact with an audience and Barack Obama for pauses. They, they're really good people. There's like hundreds of videos on YouTube, a couple of minutes long, but they're, they're effective because, again, you get to observe. Um, but when I felt, okay, I'm up to 80% in terms of confidence in public speaking, I then started looking around to work with a public speaking coach because I wanted expert help. Um, public speaking isn't my bread and butter um, so I wanted expert help and I tried a, a couple and I settled on consistently working a few times with a lady called Shireen Mitwali from uh, she's from a Dubai based organisation called On Stage International and I liked her because she got me she knew my mindset, she knew my work ethic, she kind of knew how I was using my voice um, and we became friends over time and we used to have a laugh about what we call the 20% upgrades <laughs> so before a big two-day conference and I was chairing it I'd say to Shireen I want to spend a couple of hours just doing that 20% upgrade um, and getting that bit of extra from an expert that that just changes your game not only in presenting but small scenarios many of us feel nervous just presenting to four or five people. So all of the public speaking tools and techniques and skills that I learned and developed and feel confident in them now, I can apply them to one-on-one, -on -one, to a meeting with six people or speaking in front in a hotel conference in front of a thousand. So that communication is was a game changer for me in terms of leadership. Now, Hazel, you rose in your legal career from, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, from trainee to associate to senior associate to partner at several top tier international law firms, both in London and here in the United Arab Emirates. Now, law, like many other areas, like finance or engineering, is dominated by men. What were the three key challenges at work that you faced rising up through the ranks as a female lawyer? And how did you deal with this? Because I suspect many listeners uh, to this podcast are from that gender and are facing or have faced some challenges uh, in terms of coping with issues at work, dealing with men. Um, yeah. I'll respond to this with a very personal perspective, um, what I experienced based on my character, um, because I know what different women have different experiences. Um, so you touched on law and finance being male dominated and um, they're male dominated at senior level. Um, there's a World Economic Forum study, a white paper that was done that pretty much shows law and um, finance are quite similar in that at the junior level, about 60% or 50-50 is, is men and women. Um, 
I qualified into real estate 20 years ago. Being a real estate lawyer 20 years ago, um, when I look back now, lots of sexist behavior, lots of sexist language used in everyday conversation. And then it was a male dominated industry. If you did deals, you did them most likely, mostly with men. Um, and that language, it when I look back on it, it was so consistent and so normal. Distinguish that from right or correct. It was so normal when you hear it and you're in it at the time, it's hard to recognize. Um, so, but no, I, I don't know if I was naive or very resilient, um, but at no point in my career did I believe my gender would slow me down. And in hindsight, I don't believe that it did. Um, I was brought up believing, as I said at the, the outset, if you work hard, you'll achieve your goals. And that, I literally took that on face value and applied it. And when I moved from Scotland to work in the city of London, um, with with huge international law firm, the sheer size of that law firm just instantly meant there was more diversity, more women, more lawyers of color, just more people, more diverse, but also notably, there were more positive role models. Um, and I don't just mean women lawyers, I mean partners who displayed good behaviors inclusive behaviors so so that's something that I actually notice and and I think was beneficial in my career sure as I became more senior in my career I I think you have less focus on just trying to do your best and you kind of look at things in a more macro view of the world and the macro view started to allow me to analyze micro gender bias behavior, the very small things. And I was always quite conscious to be able to call this out, but call it out, not in a way that berated people, but in a way that spurred action and change. And I, I, I probably used repetition quite a lot. Um, so I'll give you an example. I remember when I was pregnant, <laughs> asked, are you going to be coming back to work after you have the baby? And I remember just thinking, why wouldn't I be coming back to work? And I was pretty sure men who are about to become fathers weren't being asked that question. And for me, I just thought, why, why am I being asked that? And... It was a man that asked me, and he didn't mean it maliciously. I just said to him, am I coming back to work after having the baby? And I, I, and I, I probably borrowed my father's train. I just I stopped. I left silence. And I could just see in his face that kind of, oh, shit, I don't think I meant that, but I don't know what I meant. And I don't know why I asked it. And... The, the positive spin on that situation is we started a conversation, which was quite a valuable conversation, just about unconscious bias. This guy had a daughter, very uh, young daughter, and we started talking about, well, imagine that's a conversation she has when she's older, progressing through her career. And that felt like a good conversation and a good way of doing it because it changed um, the way he was thinking his behavior to something more positive and he he told me a year later I, I called somebody out on that in the, in the same way that you did to me 
So I'm not advocating repetition in those scenarios is always the right thing to do. It's it's not a cookie cutter approach. I'm, I'm sharing that in some situations, it's quite an effective tool uh, to actually getting change. When I, when I became more senior in my career, I absolutely noticed when I looked sideways, um, I saw fewer women. When I was promoted to partner at that time, I was the only woman partner in the whole of their Middle East and Asia offices. Now, now that, that changed over time. But it really made me want to become more actively involved in supporting and promoting the empowerment of women in business. And not just to talk about it. I Something that just doesn't interest me is the talking without the action. I don't think it moves the needle. I don't think it's what's valuable. And so I founded quite a few kind of internal and external women empowerment initiatives and events. And I always had the same goal in mind, particularly with these events were focused or targeted towards senior women, that those women were giving up valuable chunks of their time. And I just swore to myself, I'll give them a good return on their investment of time. So I didn't like the kind of, spa days or just the coffees yeah it's, it's good to connect and have the relaxed conversations but for me it was about having something that delivered something valuable um and then I was fortunate to be invited to to sit on a global diversity and inclusion board um where I could actively contribute to to developing impactful policies mm. Interesting. I particularly liked what you said about driving change, not by berating someone, which is so easy and so common, right? But by pausing and making them reflect on what they've said or done. Yeah. And hence by that driving action and change. That's quite a rare reaction. And I need to pick up on that actually and do more of that myself that's what that is a very valuable insight i want to continue talking about women at work um because it's such a big um an important topic when of, women of course are like you said are significantly underrepresented at senior levels in almost all domains you know finance legal real estate um i think this happens for many internal and external reasons and I want to focus on the internal reasons, um, right? As that's probably more controllable because you really can't, you really can't change your environment that much as much as you would like to or want to. So I have two questions here, Hazel, for you. The first is, what have you seen are the various ways by which women with potential self sabotage their route to success? Um, that's a good question, um, particularly as it focuses on the internal aspect. So <laughs> self-sabotage, to me, that, that's that inner voice that just nurtures doubt, disbelief, and it just it crushes confidence and it's toxic the node. Uh, women that experience it, it prevents them from reaching their full potential. And it's 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 just such a loss. And I've seen it manifest itself in a number of ways. Um I'll give you the top three, just based on experience over a couple of decades. And the number one I'd say is fear. And it can be fear of failure, fear of progression. And by that, I mean, 
implementing the steps to get to the next level, fear of rejection, fear of being judged or ridiculed. Um, sometimes that comes from the classroom and that stays with these women and it's got the detrimental effect of stopping them from speaking up at meetings when they're at the table and they've got something valuable to contribute. And there's nothing worse for these brilliant women who have that damn it moment. That's what I was going to say. And it's the it's fear that stopped them from saying it. Second, what I'd say is this innate desire to avoid confrontation just avoid the perception of being difficult not wanting to be labeled as a disruptor especially if no one else is doing it that first mover some might say first mover advantage it's seen as a first mover disadvantage um so that needs to avoid confrontation because I think it's going to escalate and the label they're going to get out of it is not a positive one. And the last one is a classic. It's underplaying achievements. Um, playing yourself down, your successes, your skills, um, to avoid appearing arrogant and big-headed. And the, the one explanation that I've heard time and time again from many lawyers, but also many managers and other businesses. The reason they don't do it is no one likes a show off. I've heard that phrase so many times. You don't want to be seen to be showing off. Um, and there's lots more, but they're the three that I've seen on repeat. Mm. And how would you, what are the, some tips to deal with self-sabotage from your experience? I'd say recognizing it. I, yeah. I don't think any woman consciously goes out to self-sabotage their career. So recognizing self-sabotaging habits is definitely the first step. Um, acknowledging it and replacing it with good habits. That's It's quite hard to do if you don't know you're doing it. Um, a good way to action that in practice is to get feedback. So solicit feedback from, it doesn't have to be your manager. It can be somebody else within your team or another man or woman that you recognize that habit in. So you don't always need to get advice from women and vice versa. Um, so I, identifying it is, is critical. Otherwise, you've got no chance of implementing new behaviors. Overcoming that fear, it can be done in a number of ways. A lot of it is, is, is self-recognition. So if, if you're in a company, working for that company, you've absolutely 100% got to recognize they hired you for a business purpose because they thought you were talented. Um, they weren't feeling generous on that day. They hired you for a reason because you have talent. And the reason I use talent versus hard work is you can see somebody's talent on a CV. Once you get in the door, that's when you allow people to see hard work. So all you have to do is recognize you're there, you're talented, you're qualified, because there's a piece of paper that tells you you spent four years at university or five years at that other job, you're talented and, and you have to accept, I'm good at what I do. Um, Different people respond to different techniques. Some people, it really works for them to have these positive affirmations, to look in the mirror every day and say, I'm the best at what I do. Um, that doesn't work for me. Um, thinking it and feeling it works more for me, but find everyone's not the same. Um, I'd say another good way 
of just overcoming fear is let yourself fail. Let yourself fail insignificant things, low risk situations, and that just helps you prepare with dealing with more significant failures because they're going to come. I mean, you and I both know we we failed over our careers and we learn from them and that's okay. I think women often experience that littleness perfect trap. Mm. And in some scenarios, when they're low friction, it doesn't matter. Perfect is the ultimate enemy of done. It's the enemy of good. Um, and I think, oh, I'm trying to remember, it was a Hewitt Packard survey. It's in Forbes, I think about 2021. But they did an internal survey that actually showed that men applied, um, 60, I think it was 100% of men applied for a job when they didn't think they were qualified. 60% of women applied for the job. And it's just that recognition of the woman thought we have to be 100%. We have to fulfill all the criteria to even apply for the job. So sometimes in those situations, being perfect is sometimes the worst thing you can do. So failures are good things. Um, there's a book called How to Fail by Elizabeth Day. And it's it's quite an interesting read because that talks about how you can become more familiar with failure, but more importantly, positive responses to failure. Um, mm. I think the last thing is I'd, I'd find out internally, especially if you work in a big organization, and um, find out what, what resources are available to you. Um, good big international corporates will have um, gender empowerment initiatives and they're not all about just telling women they're great and yeah, hey, go for it. They they have good courses that help with lots of different skills. So, so find out if that's available to you because it's a free resource. It's within your own umbrella and you can access it. Um, on the confrontation side, biggest tip is avoid associating confrontation with pain. Um, and the way to do that is, is is really to practice confrontation and responses to confrontation in a lot of different scenarios. There's there's a good book that's it's actually not publicized as much as it should be. It's it's quite a heavy text. I don't recommend anyone reads it cover to cover, dip in and out of it. It's called Difficult Conversations by the Harvard Negotiation Project. And it's a really good book to deal with confrontation in difficult situations. And it, it goes into difficult situations in business and in life. And I think if you read it and you've heard it, it will come to the forefront of your mind when you start approaching a difficult conversation. So it's, it's a good point of reference. And the last thing I'd say, is celebrate your achievements if you did something well celebrate it and just be comfortable with saying I'm proud of what I did if you want to credit other people because they were an integral part of that team brilliant but if it's something that's solely attributable to you own it and thank you very much so Celebrating success is, is something that I think a lot of women and a lot of the women that I've mentored have to get better at because the impact is, is huge and it can be so positive on them. And since you mentioned books um, towards the end, there's so many good books and podcasts out there that contain so much immense wisdom uh, that prevents us from having to reinvent the wheel. What are the practical steps or resources that a woman who's already a manager can take or access, like book, books and podcasts, for example, to improve her chances of entering top management slash the C-suite? 
There's a really good podcast called The Real Finance Mentor. Have you heard of that one? (laughs) (laughs) Um, You're you're spot on when you reference books, content, podcasts, anything that you can consume visually and through audio. I'd say that my biggest tip is to learn and invest in yourself. And I, I do go to to books as a brilliant source of reference, just based on what I've done and what I do now. Um, if you're on that trajectory going towards top management, try and read a diverse range of books. Don't go for the obvious ones. Um The reason I say that is you'll get a wider variety of messaging and tools and techniques. If you read the typical Leadership 101, you'll get one view of the world. Um, Things that I read that I highly recommend, um, anything, any content by the leadership expert, Simon Sinek, is, is very good. I really liked his book, start with why i liked it because he gave real business examples so he 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 referenced apple delta airlines so he goes through companies that we all know their household names um and some of his insights especially into a company's why so understanding your business if you're going towards senior management level is so important if you want a kind of smaller bite size chunk of some of his insights his very first TED talk I think it's about 17 minutes long and it was called how great leaders inspire action that that's really good I'd recommend I'd recommend Stephen Bartlett's podcast called the diary of a CEO um I'm a little bit older than Stephen he's um he's a 30 year old entrepreneur He's got a report, depending on what you read, this guy's got a reported net worth of 500 million US dollars. He's one of the entrepreneurs on Dragon's Den. It's a UK um, show. And if if you're more used to US TV, the, the, the US equivalent is Shark Tank. His podcasts are really good because he basically just interviews CEOs of huge companies and has quite a deep dive into them as people, but also what helped them become better CEOs, better managers, better business people. And he just looks at a wide variety of people. So I I find those very, very interesting. If you've got the stomach for it and you're okay with strong language and swearing then I I recommend a book called Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins it's it's basically the the story of extreme resilience um, and just a powerful mindset but it contains just a lot of stories that come from a very kind of traumatic traumatic adverse childhood Um, but some really interesting lessons I don't, I didn't take 100% out of it, but I certainly found it a valuable read. Uh, Another one along those lines, which is a very good read if you're looking for a focus on accountability and leadership, is a book called Extreme Ownership. And it's basically how US Navy SEALs lead and win. And it's, it's, story based lots of stories about combat but it's really a leadership book it's very interesting and then if I kind of go in reverse complete opposite and in complete contrast to those two books is a text that's so subtle and so nuanced that it's just so effective it's it's called be water my friend And it was written by Shannon Lee, the daughter of Bruce Lee. And if you have the time and 
the patience to understand nuance. That's a really good book in terms of the dance you do in business relationships. I find that really insightful. I think the other thing I'd recommend when you're progressing towards senior promotions in your organization is be clear, ask questions, find out what the process is, how long it takes, what you need to do just to get to that next level in your organization. I think that's absolutely critical. So now that you talked about the challenges faced by women at work and what they should do, I'm interested how you navigated your way to the top of a prestigious law firm and became partner, which when I was in the big four accounting firm, becoming partner was like becoming God. So uh, how did you reach heaven? That's a myth they want you to believe. <laughs> the next generation know that partners are not the prize. Um, I, I'd probably been doing it the role for a long time day on day before I I was actually made up to partner so um my partnership process was quite similar to um the process that you'd go through at most big international law firms and it might be quite similar to to the big four um it basically involved presenting a personal case uh, which is just telling um, your leadership, why you should be partner, what good leadership behaviours do you have, what would that mean for the business, and submitting a business case, which talks more about financials, revenue generation, but importantly, what can you bring in terms of those things and how will you do it? So in very brutal terms, that just boils down to how many millions of dollars can you bring in the door in the next three years that will pay for yourself X amount of times over plus pay for your team? Um, one thing I would say, quite often in partnership promotion processes, candidates don't appreciate um, companies need to be profitable. So they need to be able to promote you because you you're good, but they also need to promote you because you're going to win business. Mm. Um, I just got hold of all of the relevant forms at an early stage. I use the kind of time management tips I talked about earlier, uh, the big written submissions. I use the kind of small uh, chunk approach, uh, made sure I had enough time. Um, I had lots of meetings to attend to as part of the process I just diarized them and stuck in half an hour on each side um, and it, it's really important to manage your time properly because you're going through the process and all the demands of it at the same time as doing your job so it's a bit of juggling I also knew I could talk about my financial performance in numbers rather than describe it so that's a big tip I'd give people. Know uh, if, if you work in an industry where monthly billings is important, know how much you've brought in, keep a log of it. If winning clients is a major part of what you do in your promotion process, keep a log of your successes and just be able to, to say your success rate. Is it 60% in the last 12 months? Is it 80? Um, and present that information if you're asked to do it in writing, in, in graphs, um, or chat charts um, so being able to describe your past financial experience um, using numbers rather than lots and lots of words is, is definitely a benefit and it helps the people who are interviewing you mm. um, and the last thing I did I, I, I spoke to people who had been through the process uh, I spoke to some people who had been turned down for partnership lots and lots of times and it's like passing your driving test um, you don't need to be a good driver to pass first time around. Mm. All those stories were were really helpful. If if you've got people listening that are going through that promotion, whether it's partnership or that kind of senior level, quite a good book is um, a book called Poised for Partnership by a lady called Heather Townsend. 
if you're a lawyer, that book pretty much tells you the process that you're going to go through in any kind of big law firm. Most law firms' process is really quite similar. That's a really effective book. It's just full of techniques, tools, um, and she's quite good at helping you how to organise. So that would be my my top tip. So, in our last conversation, you talked at length about the importance of negotiation skills in the legal world. And you've, of course, used your negotiation skills with me over the past few weeks as well, as I'm very well aware. I'm sure this you is... noticed. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I was very, very well aware of what you were doing, but it's all for the greater good. So, But I'm sure this is a skill that is valuable across disciplines and also for leaders, especially, right? Um, what are the top three skills or behaviors one must cultivate to become successful at negotiation, whether, whether it's at with clients or with colleagues or with your superiors? What, are, what is the secret sauce, Hazel? The secret sauce, Vinod, and I think you need the secret sauce every single day. When you become aware of it, 80% of the conversations you have every day are small negotiations. So this is not a skill lawyers need. It's a skill everyone needs. Um, it's, it's, it's so critical. Um, skills and behaviours, I think you need to prepare. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Um, and that's regardless of, of whether it's a peer review or... A, big value, big, big ticket meeting, prepare an agenda, means there's a structure, um, use evidence to, to support what you're about to say. If you're about to go in and have a discussion on salary, um, be prepared to talk about your past achievements, um, be prepared to demonstrate that you've met KPIs. Uh, in big meetings where you, you're going into kind of adverse negotiation just know who's attending from the other side um sometimes if you go in as a cfo and you think it's just the cfo on the other side turning up and they bring the legal team or they bring the ceo know who's turning up so you're not surprised if you don't know them stalk them on linkedin find out a bit more information about them because you might have worked at the same mm. business uh, previously and that creates a connection be punctual if it's a physical meeting, turn up five meet five minutes early. And the same if it's a, a virtual meeting, just log on five minutes early to avoid what we all did in COVID. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Just get the technical rubbish out of the way. Don't back to back yourself in meetings in your calendar. Um, if you know you have a meeting to go to straight after an important negotiation, you haven't left a bit of buffer time. If you're not an experienced negotiator, you'll be put under pressure to concede things that you might not have conceded otherwise. So don't put yourself under that time pressure. Anticipate surprises. Um, if you're not an experienced negotiator, or you're very junior, if you're not leading a negotiation, anticipate what might be an unwelcome surprise. And that can range from just being handed a new piece of information or a new document at the meeting. Um, if it's very technical, it's very important that you digest and think about it. And if you're not acting for yourself, you're re representing your business, don't feel pressured to read it on the spot. Just take it, say thank you and say, I'll need to digest this and I'll come back to you ASAP. If you're junior, um, if you're ever in a situation where you turn up on time and your boss or the person leading the negotiation is half an hour late or late, know beforehand, what, how can I get started where I'm not in that kind of frantic rabbit in a headlight situation? So have pre-agreed things that you can start off with and things you can valuably get out of the way. And if you do get thrown into the negotiation, try not to commit to a position and just when your lead negotiator comes in, just reframe everything that you've heard 
succinctly so it can be dealt with. Second super important thing, there's no substitute for active listening. I said it before, two ears, one mouth, use them in that ratio. Active listening is just making sure you're not distracted, listening to everything that's being said. Most people listen to wait for the pause so they can start talking. Or when they're listening, they start thinking, I wonder what I could say in response. So they're not listening. And the, the reason active listening is essential in negotiations is it allows you to block, uh, deploy specific techniques that are highly effective. It allows you to ask calibrated questions. The calibrated questions are really how and what questions. They're, they're structured for maximum effect. And they basically, they allow the other side to see things from your side of the table. So examples are things like, how are we meant to do that? What happens if we don't pay? And excellent negotiators use calibrated questions to make their counterparties feel heard. But what they're actually doing is nudging them towards a deal. And this gives your party, your, your counterpart, whoever you're negotiating opposite, that illusion of control. But you can only ask good calibrated questions if you've actively been listening to what's been said mm. using pauses and mirroring again highly effective techniques so if you're not used to being uncomfortable with pauses or being comfortable with pauses and silences just practice them because they work to your advantage and you need to practice it if you naturally speak quickly. Um, because of where I grew up, my accent, I naturally speak slowly. So I'm, I'm comfortable with pausing and silence because it feels like a natural part of my fabric. And it's important to use pauses. For example, if you ask a calibrated question, you need to pause to give the other side time to respond. And if you're not too creepy about it and staring after you've said the question, asked the question and pausing. It puts a bit of gentle but comfortable pressure on them to respond. So you get more when you um, use those questions and use pauses, allow people to answer. Um, I mentioned mirroring. That's an effective technique and it's simple. So if you're not an experienced negotiator it's an easy one to to pick up and it, it it's just a mirror it just involves repeating the last three or four words somebody said um so if somebody says in that kind of employee employer situation i don't earn enough to keep doing this job the mirror is don't earn enough and that calibrated that calibrated question or, or that mirror, I should say, it it just allows that person to explain a bit more about what they've got they wanted to say and they want to get off their chest. And it can give you quite a valuable edge. So I don't earn enough. That might not be them talking about money. They might be thinking I don't earn enough respect. I don't have enough resources. So if you don't use this technique to draw out more information and in that scenario you could end up paying somebody more and pushing the real issue under the carpet um and that that mirroring technique i think it works best um just to diffuse anger or hostility and it it results in your counterparty just revealing a lot more information the the secret I want to share with you and everyone else that's listening. Who doesn't love a secret, right, Vinod? <laughs> um, Absolutely. And the reason I say it's a secret, people don't recommend this book. It's not widely recommended, and it's a it's a game changer. Whether you're senior, junior, whatever you do, it's a game changer. It's a book 
And all the techniques I've mentioned and I use and I have used for the last six years um, really come from the learnings in this book. It's a book by a guy called Chris Moss and it's called Never Split the Difference. And Chris Moss spent, I think, about 25 years with the FBI. He was the lead negotiator and he used to negotiate the success, successfully negotiate the release of hostages that had been taken by bank robbers and, and terrorists. And I recommend getting this book. I have it in audio and in written format, but audio is brilliant because the techniques on pause, on tone, you really hear them on the audio book. Um, I've recommended that book to lawyers, CEOs, um, entrepreneurs, and they, when they've used them, I always get the same feedback. Oh, that's that's gold dust. That was brilliant. I used that to work like a charm. Any parents listening, if you constantly lose the negotiation on reduced screen time with your kids, all the techniques in that book work like a charm. Use them. Won, won, won those negotiations with that 10 year old. I should get hold of that book so that I'm aware of the tactics that you'll use with me the next time you negotiate something. <laughs> you need five years of me in the middle. <laughs> Let's see. And, and you, you, you made a really, um, what you just said there, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's about getting the book and practicing because there's no point reading it if you don't practice the, the techniques. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about self-awareness, which is a huge, huge topic uh, in terms of leadership and emotion diligence. And uh, most leaders, well, many leaders that I have met or have interacted with or know of lack self-awareness and have no clue about how they're perceived by others or even why they behave the way they do. You know? um, and I, I must admit, I, I was probably part of that uh, huge club not too long ago. And hence, I find self-awareness and values to be extremely important and powerful based not just personal experience, but also from talking to clients, um, former students, friends, ex-colleagues. Um, and almost every coaching and mentoring conversation I have with coaching clients come back to these basics, self-awareness and values. So I've got three questions for you on this topic. Mm -hmm. First one, this is the easy one, right? On a, on a scale of zero to 10, where zero is abysmal and 10 is brilliant, how self-aware are you and how clear are you about your values? I love the way you call them easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, self-awareness rate myself a 7 or an 8 mm -hmm. clarity on my values a 10 I'm going to ask you how you arrived at this rating which is my second question and I'm asking this so that listeners to this podcast can look at themselves their thoughts and their behaviours and the impact on others and possibly have a go at assisting themselves? Yeah. Um, it's interesting what you said when you introduced that question about you belonging to that club um, of possibly so um, low self-awareness. We all start off in that club. Mm. It's not, I don't think self-awareness is something that you're born with. Um, I believe that self-awareness and self-improvement go hand in hand. So where I could see that I'd improved at something, I became more self-aware. Um, and you get that, as you say, through feedback. Uh, techniques that I use um, to become more self-aware include mindful meditation, so the, the 10 minutes I talked about, just once a week, 10 minutes reflecting on, on failures and how to, to develop. I write down my goals. Again, writing down my goals allows me to understand to have the skills 
to achieve them? What do I need to to make these goals a reality? Um, and quite often in the past, I've written down what I'm passionate about. Am I doing something that makes me happy and that I enjoy as well as being good at it? Because being good at something doesn't mean you also enjoy it. And then I, I think before I started uh, running businesses, I asked myself, well, what, what's stopping me from following that passion? And at one point in my career, I'll be very honest, there'll be lots of investment bankers and lawyers that can identify the golden cage stopped me. Mm. So at one point, those those huge paychecks, they're, they're the golden cage. They, they prevent you from just saying, forget it. Money is not the top priority. Um, so being able to explain to yourself why you're not following a path that you'd like to can be quite powerful i do i do that often mm. so so we, you described yourself assessment in terms of self awareness and values and and how you became more self aware but tell me how did you identify your values my values haven't changed much in the last 20 years they've become stronger and I feel them stronger um, and I feel them in my decision making. So it's, for me, it's easy to identify my values. Big structural shifts in my life made some values more important than others. For me, the most effective way of crystallizing my values is to write them down um, rather than contemplating them. I'd say now my my I've got many values. My top three authenticity. For me, that's pretty basic. It just means being myself regardless of the circumstance. Um second one is hard work. Um I, I told you about my kind of experience or introduction to that value uh, at a young age. And it served me well throughout my career. What's changed a little bit in that value is I don't compare myself to anyone. I am my own competition. I really dislike that command that you hear often on social media. Be the hardest worker in the room. You can be in a room. Imagine you're a, a year 12 school pupil and the rest of the room are kindergarten kids it's the same when you're adult why you can why does it matter who's in the room so that be the hardest worker in the room compare yourself to others think like an athlete athletes good athletes don't do that so i focus on what i control and i can control what i do i don't have control over others so that's hard work important value but it's it's changed as to how i apply it and the third one i i would say is is it definitely trust it's trust is the most important foundation to a good relationship and i mean that in personal relationships and business relationships it helps those relationships stand the test of time and i i I've had lots of repeat work from the same clients because they trust me in meetings, but they trust me with their business. Now, I have interacted with you on quite a few occasions. And something that always struck me, Hazel, is that calmness is a superpower that you seem to possess in abundance. I know that because I've spent a lot of time with wow. you face to face. Yes. Uh, and even when, when we discuss tricky, complex topics, you never know, once reacted defensively or angrily as many would have. Uh, your responses were typically yeah. calm, tactful, thoughtful, and overall, you know, stunningly mature. Now, this is a crucial trait in leadership where a typical day presents so many opportunities to lose your cool. Uh, because of the complexity of the environment and, and the way we work. 
what are the three ways that have helped you stay calm? Well, thank you. I think that's, I take that as a compliment. Um, I didn't know I was being observed. <laughs> All right, top three. Um, I don't have any expectations. Um, when I have a conversation, I expect that somebody will have a different view to me and I'm okay with somebody saying I'm wrong. Um, I don't feel the need to instantly react. Um, and I think that's over years, you begin to choose your battles, what actually matters. Second one, I use time and silence well. Um, I don't feel rushed to say what I want to say. Um, I talk slowly and I always have done, so that, that helps. Um, so that feels natural and being able to pause um, does deliver a sense of calm and control, particularly if it's a, a situation full of friction. Third one, I'd say I'm I'm pretty self-aware. I'm, I'm comfortable in my own skin. I don't feel compelled to prove anything to anyone, um, particularly at this, this stage in my life and, and career journey. Uh, I guess I'm kind of a smooth rhino. Um, all those wrinkles that you get over time, um, you, you take them, you learn from them, and they smooth themselves out. And it gives you this tremendous sense of inner peace and, and confidence. Um, but... I'd say there's a fourth, um, it's quite a tricky one for for me to explain, and um, it stems from how I dealt with loss. Um, when my parents passed away, I went through a lot of emotions, including a lot of anger. Um, and I lost these two superheroes in my life within 10 years of each other, my, my father in 2010 and um, my mum later. When when my mum passed away, I just remember it so well. I, I, the lead up to it, I was midway through this massive real estate transaction that I was leading and I, I, I took two weeks off. I, I got back to Scotland in time to be with her. And I, I came back to to Dubai after the, the funeral. And I, I pushed myself harder than I'd ever worked before. And I had this, Benoda, I had this intense desire just to win at all costs. Um. And, and that stayed with me for a while. Losing parents at any age, it's catastrophic. I felt like a house that had lost its roof. And that really, losing two people that influenced me so much, that I cared about so much, that examined me, that, that, sorry, that forced me to examine my own mortality and how I wanted to be deliberate about how I live my life. And when trauma disrupts your family, you just, you can't describe how that feels. But I, I, I recognize that gave me a lot of strength. So those two events and how I dealt with it um, just gave me a lot. And I think that is the single biggest reason that nothing phases me now. <laughs> mm. um, That's interesting how, I find it fascinating actually how often major traumatic events in our lives can shape us and either make us, as they say, bitter or better. 
what you seem to have benefited and sort of moved on and discovered a or formed a different world view which i find brilliant because that's probably closer to reality than most of us would ever reach so well done for that revelation although it came because of a massive personal loss i want to talk about something and hence wrap up this very interesting interview and that is your tips your top 3 career tips for senior executives i know we have covered some of few of that earlier in this conversation but i just i want something from you you know in, in these days of sound bites <laughs> and uh, <laughs> i want three quick quick tips from you uh, to end this fascinating session <laughs> Oh, I know where you're going with this. You mentioned sound bites. Um, okay, quick tips. Top three. Number one, anticipate and embrace change. We all had to to pivot um, during COVID, but new technology has been developed every day, and it's going to change how we do business, and it's going to change how the people in our business work in that organization so use it to your advantage and the advantage of your business second one practice active listening is going to improve how you communicate um, with internal stakeholders clients peers employees and is really going to elevate your career path communication is absolute key if, if you're looking at um staying in senior management positions and the last one I'd, I'd say just keep investing in yourself uh, never think that you're there senior management is a journey it's not um, a destination the books and the podcasts that I've recommended they're they're brilliant resources um, I would say if you're new to senior management you might be unpleasantly surprised at the additional layer of admin and meetings that occupy time in your diary. So being really effective with time management is, is just going to be the best thing that you can do. And on that note, that neatly segues to the wrap up of this session, uh, since we need to manage time as well. Although I must say it was fascinating to not to record the session, but to also, and I mean this sincerely, to have spent time with you over the past few months going over the objectives of the session, the script, the questions, and getting to know you, because of which I should say I've, I've picked up quite a few invaluable tips on staying calm, using pauses, <laughs> negotiation skills, never being defensive, um, preparation, I could go on and on. So I hope the listeners of this podcast take away these and other immensely valuable tips that you have so kindly and painstakingly spelled out in this in-depth, long-form podcast. I think they'll benefit hugely. It's like I always say, uh, the opposite of reaming in the wheel and can really propel their careers uh, it's almost like getting a virtual coach or mentor. So thank you so much again, Hazel, for spending the time. Um, since especially I know that you are in the middle of uh, of, of leading a, a real estate transaction. Um, and you still took the time, um, several hours today and many hours before today as well, to discuss this podcast with me. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for the listeners for, for uh, you know, taking the time to go through this long podcast. And uh, thank you once again, Hazel. Thank you, Pinod, and thank you to you for, for allowing me to be honest, and also to your listeners for, if, if they do stay with us to this point, for allowing me to slice into their day and, and spend this time with them. So th thank you very much. This is brought to you by The Real Finance Mentor. Thank you so much for listening. And I really hope you found it insightful and inspirational. If you did enjoy this episode, please drop us a review and spread the word. 
and be sure to check out more exclusive content on the realfinancementor.com and my LinkedIn profile, which is Binot Shankar CFA. Let's keep in touch. Just add your name to the mailing list on the realfinancementor.com and we'll tell you about new episodes, plus book reviews, upcoming events, and blogs. Till the next time, onwards and upwards.